watch the the video that trended was Arjun Tendulkar eating his own. Oh, yeah, I'm not going to talk about that. <laughs> <laughs> he copped enough stick about that from the team. But, I mean, but, and then people pointed out that Virat Kohli did the same, oh. so he's in good company. It's, I think okay. it was. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. No comment. <laughs> <laughs> what did Ishan Kishan think about it after that came out? Oh, I'm sure. I'm sure. Lala, Lala is Lala. <laughs> Lala. I love Ishan. He's a funny guy, yeah. and I love the banter I have with him. And look, he. He, he doesn't care. I mean, yeah. that's just the nature of the banter that you go through with players. And sometimes, I don't know, Chappie, you called him a dickhead. If you're being a dickhead, <laughs> you're being a dickhead. And he, and, and he probably, the young Ishan Kishan probably would have acknowledged he was being a dickhead. And every now and again, we still call him a dickhead. <laughs> a little bit because he is and a little bit out of love. So, yeah, yeah, I mean, you just sort of forget that stuff. That, that's the thing about, you know, when you spend time in an organisation for a long period of time and you have these players... You think of Ishan and um, like Boomra, Rowett, yeah. Rowett, Hardik was there for a long time. You become quite close with them and good friends with them and that, that's the one great part of when you're in a competition for a period of time, you make really good friendships from, obviously from your own countrymen who turn up in your team, but also um, people from all over the world, which is really cool. Welcome once again to yet another episode of the Global Punt live, not live, but uh, from GT20 in Canada. Um, the series uh, has been very, very exciting. A lot of exciting things have happened, big sixes. People have cleared the grounds, excitement has happened. I'm going to talk to somebody who's very exciting. In my childhood, I remember watching uh, this guy bowling and uh, it, it was really fun because he used to get the ball to swing very late. Um, he got uh, a lot of wickets against India, fantastic average. And he's uh, currently the uh, bowling coach of the Mumbai Indians. Um, this is Shane Bond, who has an excellent record. He was one of the quartet of fastest bowlers at, at the time when he was uh, at his peak, uh, along with Akhtar, Lee and uh, I forgot, we've discussed it in the, in the video. So uh, with Shane Bond, it was a very, interesting conversation it was very unfiltered very fun we spoke about the Mumbai Indians Netflix documentary we spoke about uh, Mumbai Indians having no star power in the bowling department at the start of the IPL and still performing well and uh, a lot of um, very unfiltered content so enjoy this conversation with Shane Bond again get on our telegram group for early releases and if you want to see me do stand-up comedy jokes uh, here are the details tickets are on saurabhpanth.com enjoy this chat with Shane Bond Remove that part. All right, welcome to another episode of the Global Panth. Uh, I'm running out of clothes because uh, they've misplaced my laundry. So I'm sorry for repeating clothes every episode, but this is all I have left. I have no clean clothes left. Anyway, very excited. Uh, the gentleman I'm interviewing today was uh, one of my heroes growing up. I used to bowl very fast and swing the ball late. Here, I'm going to read out these averages. 21.7 in T20s, 20.9 in ODIs, and 22.1 in tests. That's ridiculous. We have uh, the venerable. Is that a good term to describe you, venerable? I have no idea what you're talking about. <laughs> <laughs> the word's too big for me. Uh, Shane Bond is here. Hi, Shane. How are you doing? Uh, it's nice to be here, mate. Yeah. Thanks a lot. Thanks a lot for your time. Really appreciate it. As we discussed, second time I'm interviewing you. Uh, the first time it was Anil Kumble, you and Ricky Ponting, and Anil Kumble was uh, very intimidating. Yeah, it's. I mean, it's a big two. Big two, isn't it? <laughs> me, with me tagging along. And we're talking about it's 2015. Yeah. And it... Um, the stuff, you know, we were talk you talked about what we're going to talk about today and you think back to 2015 and, you know, you're nearly, what, eight, nine years on from there um, and you go back and talk about your career and when you started and, you know, that's over 20 years ago since I started international cricket, so Oof. it's scary how fast you get old. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh, but listen, I, I want to ask you this, was 100 miles per hour, was that ever an ambition as a fast bowler that I want to hit that or was it just like, let's just go? I think, I think, yeah, you, obviously it would have been awesome. I yeah. mean, to watch Brett and Sean and Shoah crack that barrier, I mean, there's something pretty exciting about it. And we had the chance the other day to go to the baseball and the pitcher came up and was throwing 100 miles an hour. And it, even watching that was exciting. Yeah. So, uh, yeah, you, you thought about it. I was probably a yard slower than those guys. But, you know, I was quick enough to hurry a couple of guys up. And every time you just inched that pace up a little bit, it was quite exciting and good for the ego. So... Yeah, it was only until I first played my first test that I actually knew how fast I bowled, and within two months it had gone sort of boom, boom, boom. Yeah. But it was nice to be um, talked about in the same bracket as those guys because it's you know it was an exciting time for fast bowling. I remember when you, I think you, uh, Akhtar and Tate used to, and of course Lee, the pitch just seems smaller. Were you like, has it shrunk? What happened? It like... certainly didn't feel like that at times. <laughs> I mean, we also played in an era of um, great batsmen, yeah. and I think that was... When I look back now, you know, you reflect on your career and 
you know, records, even watching now the records of test runs and stuff pop Excellent. up. Yeah. And you have a look at it and, you know, you've got Lara, Tendulkar, Dravid, Ponting, yeah. you know, all these amazing players, Callis, that you've got um, Mahela Sanger. I played against this era of just amazing players. And it was, that was quite cool. Every team you played against had these world-class batters who went on to be absolute legends. And they were just batsmen you wanted to tick off your list. Oh, I got him out, I got him out. <laughs> and it was exciting to play those guys. Hard, tough, really tough, but exciting. Who, who, who didn't you take off? Who was the one where you were like, this one got away? Was there, was well, I didn't play England in test matches. So there were obviously guys like Kevin Peterson, oh. you know, those, who, was a, who was an amazing player who I didn't get out. Um, but a lot of the other guys I, I got the chance to play against in test cricket. Um, and it was, yeah, it was cool. K KP was the one who got away. He yeah. was. I got him out of one-day cricket, yeah. but I never got a chance to play England in Test cricket, which was disappointing. You know, I saw this, I don't know if you've seen this, but in 1979, they did a fast bowling competition of world's fastest bowler. Where it was Imran Khan and, I mean, everybody who was just, I think, Malcolm Marshall and all, all of that. I mean, in your era, that would be the only other era where I'm like, yeah, that would be a great showdown. Shirtless, everybody was shirtless in 1979 for some strange reason. Michael Holding. Outside the off stump, nothing for accuracy, but it certainly looked pretty quick. Jeff Thompson watching on. He's the man out in front. He's the one they're chasing. And by gosh, they're going to make every effort with this last ball. Andy Roberts. Yeah, I don't know about that. I don't know about us all being shirtless. <laughs> um, yeah, I'm, I, and the thing is, there are days, there are days where, and pr probably those other guys would say the same, is where even though the radar said one thing, there were probably days where you felt like you bowled faster and would love to have known for whatever reason what the pace was, whether it be in first class cricket um, or just some game that it wasn't on. Um, and you'd go, I wonder how quick it was that day, just the radar wasn't around. But yeah, it was certainly exciting. I really did enjoy um, looking up on the big screen and, and seeing that. And, and I think it's just an element of the game that the public love. As soon as they see that, whether it be 90 miles an hour plus or or 140, late 140s into 150s, crowds get excited when they see that sort of pace. Yeah, especially the bouncer bowled at that pace. Oof, it's yeah. a lot. It's so much fun to watch. I, I think the other thing was, you, you sort of wonder what it would be like to face you. you know, what would it, and, and so the only time I got to experience, obviously I, I went out and faced Dale Stain as a night watchman and Brett Lee <laughs> with new balls. <laughs> And it wasn't very nice. <laughs> so, yeah, so you sort of get a, uh, an, uh, an appreciation of how talented the batsmen are when they have, when you bowl against those sorts of players, you know, the De Villiers and Mahela, and they've got so much time, and you go, geez, it just felt like the game was on absolute fast forward when I was batting. But those guys make it look so easy. But who sent you as a night watchman? I mean, that's like, the, uh, first of all, I mean, just the concept of a night watchman uh, as, as, a, as a bowler. Don't you just go like, hey, just do your job? 100%. Why, why I agree I with I, I agree with that. It was like a lamb to the slaughter, really. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, it's an interesting concept, isn't it? Because, you know, you're almost like, a, not a free wicket, but um, you almost feel like as a bowler, let the batsmen do their job. And if I can come in when they're a little bit tired and not bowling as fast, I might be able to last a little <laughs> bit longer. I lasted, I think, about eight balls that night. So I got through... Got through the evening and lasted about the same the next day before I got my poles knocked over by Dale. Not not bad. I mean, no, yeah. it was okay. <laughs> eight balls would stay in yeah. It was. I mean, it was a good experience. That's the thing. It was a good experience. Yeah. Okay. Uh, we're talking about fast bowling. There's a there's a teammate of yours who I, I was the opposite of fast bowling, and uh, this gentleman is the inspiration for Virat Kohli as a bowler, which is Chris Harris. I always used to watch Chris Harris bowl, and I was like, what is he doing? That like nobody's nobody was able to hit him. So what is it? And I think Chris, I think only uh, like my generation of people will understand what Chris Harris was like because nobody seemed to hit him off the square. I think his, his economy was about 4.2 or some ridiculous amount. So what was it about him that like nobody could, could get him off? Well, it just it didn't do anything. Like he was just a straight <laughs> slow bowler. I, I'm still trying to work it out. I think, I think in the modern game, the king, because we called him the one day king because he could bat, bowl and yeah, yeah. field, he'd be destroyed, I think. Yeah. He bowled a massive big in-swinger. So when he started off, he was a genuine in-swing bowler, and actually he was tricky to hit. Then he just bowled these little rolling leg cutters <laughs> off the wrong foot that everyone sort of was like, I don't know whether they were too scared to get out, but he just, he just managed to go to four and over and was difficult to hit. Yeah, he's one of my favourite cricketers I play with, Harry, one of the funniest guys of all time. Yeah. And, and it's, he's one of those guys who found a way, you know, reinvented himself, offered something different, and at the time his bowling was hugely effective. And, uh, he was a great player to play with. Yeah, and he was one of the first few guys I saw. I'm like, hey, you can be bold and successful. It was a great That's true. You don't see too many guys around like that, do you? Especially yeah. like not, he wasn't genuinely all shaved yeah. bald. He still had the bits on the side. So yeah, he yeah. was, 
No, he was like 35 going on 50, wasn't he? <laughs> <laughs> and the boys were into him. You've got to shave your head, Harry, but he still hasn't. <laughs> and he's got that, I think he's got that century where he almost won that match for New Zealand, I think, was it? Yeah, one of the great innings for New Zealand. Yeah. We're playing Australia in a World Cup quarterfinal. Yeah. And he came out in Chennai and whacked 130, just smashed Oof. Australia all around the field, who had a great bowling attack. And, um, yeah, he, as I said, he was a seriously talented player. Um, I played provincial cricket with him, watched his... Actually, I used to, when I was about 13, I used to work on the side screens and the scoreboard at Lancaster Park in my hometown of Christchurch, and I saw Harry make his first class debut there. And um, so I sort of grew up as a kid watching him wow. and then playing with him, and obviously now we're friends afterwards, so that's pretty cool. Yeah, he seems like a very, very interesting cricketer. I was always like, I'm always impressed with, with cricketers who just, as you said, just made it work and successful, you know, very successful career. And again, uh, for anybody watching, go watch Virat Kohli and compare it to Chris Harris. We'll put up a video and it's, it's roughly the same bowling. Okay, now it's been obviously many, many years, but uh, prior to the I I IPL, there was the ICL. And you've spoken about it quite a lot, but I just, I just thought it was so interesting that the ICL is just brushed away as a thing that occurred. <laughs> like it lasted for about two, three years. Yeah. Uh, and uh, it just, uh, you're playing in, in grounds that were not the main grounds and all of that kind of stuff. So was it fun playing that league? The, I mean, that's the that's a bigger question. Was it a fun league to be part it of? It was fun, mate, because, I mean, I, I suppose we preceded the IPL. Um, and for me, you know, having played, a, you know, a number of years of international cricket, the, the, the after-match drinks or end of series, you'd have a drink, but there was a little bit of standoffishness between a lot of the international teams. Right. I wouldn't say we got on, but there was, there was not really a relationship between a lot of the players. So you had all these people who you'd played against but didn't really know very well. And in the situation of the ICL, we were all banned. So we were ostracised from international cricket. So there was a natural camaraderie for us. Uh, and, you know, as it turned out in the hotel every night, there was sort of this happy hour where all the teams would stay and would congregate sort of between 6 o'clock and 7.30. And, you know, during that time, you got to know these people who you played against really well. You know, the Damien Marns, the Jason Gillespie's, the Lance Klusners these players from all over the world, and Barty Raidu was there. Like. Yeah, yeah. So these guys who then actually then transitioned like I did into the IPL. Um, and it was just awesome because it was really relaxed. Um, the cricket was still fun, but just to get to know those guys was fantastic. And then you, you sort of have those relationships now that carry forward to now. So yeah, it was a fun time. You, we were still playing cricket. It was hard because you know we weren't allowed to play international cricket. Um, but still, still enjoyed that period. Yeah, met some good, good people and some really good players who, as I said, went on to do some really good stuff in the IPL as well. raidu has got something about him. He's like, every time I see him on the field, I'm like, you just smile watching Raidu do anything. Yeah. And that relationship with him and Bravo is obviously the stuff of legend. Uh, I, I did a show for Mumbai Indians once in 2013 or 14. And after the show got done, um, it was a very, very tough show because, again, Mukesh Ambani and everybody's intimidated by them being there. And I get done and uh, this gentleman comes up to me, he's like, hey man, you tried really well, good job. And I'm like, thank you so much, when are you going to play? And it was Ambiti Raidu who had played all the matches so far. And he's just looking at me like, do you not know anything? Yeah, yeah, <laughs> like, yeah, yeah. sorry, man. Yeah, uh -huh. yeah no, hell of a nice guy, yeah. uh, Bharti, and yeah, enjoyed my time working with him um, at Mumbai. He obviously, wherever he went, he was really successful. Right. had an amazing career. Um, always organised good biryani when we went to Hyderabad <laughs> as well, his hometown. So yeah, always look forward to it. And he's always got a smile on his face, he's yeah, good value. Yeah. Okay, um, you. Uh, I think this was the time. Like, uh, I think New Zealand cricketers. We uh, we used to always hear that everybody had a job aside from cricket, and yours was being a policeman. And I, I'm very curious to know what other jobs other people had in the team, and also what crimes did you see? It wasn't so. No, I was probably the only one, really. Right. Um, well, I mean, I transitioned into into professional cricket. So, you know, the big names of New Zealand cricket: the Astles, the Flemings, the Harrises, the Kens. They were they were playing cricket full time. You had someone like Adam Perori who was doing a law degree in the background. He's a very <laughs> smart guy, uh, but most of those guys were sort of earning match fees with some small retainers, but playing cricket. Um, a lot of guys at first class levels, the contracts were two thousand dollars New Zealand dollars, so wow. and you would pay for match fees. So we we did work. Um, yeah, so it was it was interesting. And then I came into the team about a year later. Everyone went on strike. Players Association was formed, and then the game turned professional. Right. Just before India turned up, actually which added sort of an element of pressure. Uh, yeah, the, the, I loved the job in the police. Right. I, lo I loved the, and it's a little bit like cricket. I love the fact that you go to work every day and you never know what's going to happen. Right. Um, so there was, there was elements of times that was really quiet and then times it was all go. Um, times where you relaxed and then under, you know, extreme stress and you were certainly dealing with situations that until you're faced with them, it was, you, you, you don't know how you're going to handle it. That's, you know, death and car crashes and plane crashes and 
all sorts of fights and all that sort of stuff. So, yeah, it was it was uh, challenging, but I think it actually built for me built a lot of uh, confidence because you sort of learn how to handle situations that were challenging right. to sort of step outside your comfort zone, which is exactly what international cricket is. It's intimidating. You're you're out of your comfort zone. You're under pressure. Right. But that was, I was sort of two or three years of doing that in the police, I, was, I sort of prepared me for international cricket. <laughs> that's a, that's a, that's a yeah, yeah. hell of an endorsement for yeah. both uh, sides, which is both being a cop and a, and a thing. Okay, let's talk about Mumbai Indians. Um, there was this um, the documentary which was made about the Mumbai Indians. I thought it was quite fascinating to get the inside and all. Do you think the only reason they've not made a new one is because of somebody calling somebody a dickhead? Is that oh, that's <laughs> Chappie, yeah, the trainer. Yeah. Cool, yeah, I like that. <laughs> yeah, it was one of the things he just shook his head, but I quite enjoyed that moment. Yeah. Yeah, it's an interesting one, isn't it? It was, it's, um, it was really different to do something like that um, because, I mean, we turned up and there was no warning. It was like walking in the first day oh. uh, into the accommodation at, um, at Beverly Park, the, the Mumbai Indians owner's accommodation for Reliance Park, and walked in and boom, there were cameras and we were on. And it's quite intimidating, especially when you're not expecting to walk into that. So for, a, for the first week or two, every time like we would be sitting down here with a player talking about cricket, there's you know, two oh, cameras shit. and... All these different people sitting there and would sit down and have interviews and stuff. So, Paul, who was the dickhead guy, we called the dickhead, <laughs> and I just said, Look, this is actually quite challenging. So, how are we going to break down the barriers with these people? So, the camera crew and the Netflix crew had their own sort of little bar set up at the hotel. Right. And we just invited ourselves down one night and just spent the evening with the guys having a couple of drinks, getting to know who the camera crew were and stuff, and a little bit about them as people. And it was really good. It was a fun night. And it, and it changed the whole perspective because we turned up the next day, rather than just dealing with a crew, we were dealing with people who were, you know, or yeah. were friends now. Right. So you sort of just forgot about it. The, the things came back on, they were there, and there was a little bit more banter. And, and they talked a little bit about the patterns and things that we were talking about. Right. So they talked about me talking about dinner a lot. You're talking about dinner and food. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't know I was doing that. I don't know whether that's a good or bad thing. So that was, um, yeah, and, I, and you also get the chance as a coach to look back and watch yourself, which can be uncomfortable at times. Right. Okay, how do I talk? Am I articulate? What does it look like? Yeah, and it's weird, but it's cool at the same time. So it's a shame the next season we went on and we won the tournament. Um, and, you know, there's a lot of now sports docos out there that have followed teams and some are successful, some uh, the other end of the spectrum, but it was certainly a different experience. Uh, and now where social media is such a big part, part in sport, right. you have cameras around anyway. Anyway, At Mumbai you do, there's always social media floating around, filming stuff, the same here. Um, so you, it's sort of prepared you for what was to come, which is, you know, a lot of that social media presence. What, what, what is it about you that you saw about yourself where I'm like, oh, I didn't know I did this, like aside from the food one? Like, I'm sure it's, it's it's always that, okay, oh, I didn't know I spoke this particular sentence so often. Yeah, yeah, there's sometimes there are words that you say yeah. that you go, I'm repeating myself. The tone of your voice, you can find your own voice irritating. So, God, do I sound like that? I'm <laughs> irritating. Um, but also just the way um, you fit into the team when you speak, all that sort of stuff was interesting. So, yeah, it was a, it was a cool experience, the, yeah. the, the, whole, the whole thing. And you'd have to speak to the players because they must have found it challenging as well. Because oh yeah. it does, it certainly adds a, a different layer of pressure. What did Ishan Kishan think about it after that came out? Oh, I'm sure. I'm sure. Lala, Lala, Lala is Lala. <laughs> Lala. I love Ishan. He's a funny guy, yeah. and I love the banter I have with him. And that, look, he 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 doesn't care. I mean, yeah. that's just the nature of the banter that you go through with players. And sometimes, I don't know, Chappie, you called him a dickhead. If you're being a dickhead, you're being a dickhead. And, he, and, and Ish probably, the young Ish and Kishin probably would have acknowledged he was being a dickhead. And every now and again, we still call him a dickhead. <laughs> a little bit because he is and a little bit out of love. So, yeah, I mean, you just sort of forget that stuff. That, that's the thing about, you know, when you spend time in an organisation for a long period of time and you have these players, you think of Ishan and um, like Boomerah, Rowett, yeah. Rowett, Hardik was there for a long time. You become quite close with them and good friends with them, and that, that's the one great part of when you're in a competition for a period of time. You make really good friendships from, obviously, from your own countrymen who turn up in your team, but also um, people from all over the world, which is really cool. I mean, I, I think from the outside, I'm very curious to know what what does a bowling coach do? Because again, you have like a lim you, it's not like you have such a limited time with them. As you said, the IPL goes on for whatever 12 weeks. Yep. It is, it's, it's quite a considerable time. And you can make a few tweaks, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. But what is it like? Because this year was a tough start. I think this was the first time that the Mumbai Indians started the IPL without any superstar international. 
there's no there's no malinga there's no bumrah there's no bolt there's no bhaji there's uh, archer was not fully fed so how do you, how did you deal with that because this is going to be the toughest for you as a bowling coach where you like oh i have to get the young guys up or something like that well, it was i think it was a tough year for bowling coaches all around there were some you know <laughs> some big scores going around the ipl so every time we whether i bumped into adam griffiths or whoever i bumped into around the traps dale stanks like Oof, it's not a tough day at the office you know 200 plus scores yeah. Look, it's, it's the same sort of stuff. You build relationships, you work out what, how to get the best out of players, what their skill set is, how do you best prepare the team, what are the plans you can give them so they can prepare under pressure, help the captain, you know, obviously get the information across that we think is relevant. Um, and so you're just working as a group with the coach and the head coach and the captain and all the players to try and just make improvements every day and, and come up with a way to win. Doesn't have to be perfect because T20 is never going to be that light. But you're doing, you're trying to do enough to get you enough wins. You know, we got really close this year. You yeah. know, we got really close to to making a final. I mean, that's a credit to the guys. We didn't have the big names, but the boys worked pretty hard together, and our batting fired on all cylinders. But you know, we were close to making a final, which was pretty exciting. So, yeah, it's good fun. It's challenging because you are. It is stressful when, when you're getting whacked all over the place, and it's more stressful for the bowlers than it is for me who is watching. So. You're just trying to help them. And it's not so much the technical stuff. There are little elements of technique that you work out. But you pick up on other stuff like mental process, how mm. they're training, how to train, where, where perhaps they should be bowling, where they're getting hit, all those little things. You put it together and try and get the best out of someone. Yeah, I mean, as a, as a, as a, as a bowling, bowling fan, after a point, I was getting frustrated with the IPL having those kind of scores. I'm like, every game can't have 200 being chased down. It's a, it's I, I, think, I think actually... Uh, uh, I look at it the other way and go, you know. I credit the batsmen. Like, the batsmanship now is phenomenal. Right. You know, guys, and we had guys in our team, obviously, getting to watch Ish and Rowe and Surya and Tilak Vama, oh, yeah, you yeah. know, and Tim David, and our batting kept coming and coming. And the shot making and the ability to walk out from ball one and go, boom, yeah. is incredible. Um, and that's across all the teams. So I think batting's elevated itself to a new level. But the challenge for us is a as bowlers and bowling coaches, how do we do the same with bowling? What's the next step in the elevation of bowling to counter that when you've got, you know, especially in the IPL, an extra an extra batsman with that sub rule? So, um, yeah, I, I like the okay. I, li I like that. How do I, how do I do my job and, how, and where are the gaps and opportunities for us as bowlers to to drag that back that can can bring us success? What is the? I'm, I'm sure like. I, I, there's got to be a point where in your in your in your in your role as a coach where you just you do you said something or told somebody to do something, and it happened and you're like oh this is what I'm here for, or where you're just impressed with yourself you're like ah, I deserve a pat on the back. What what happened in 2023 where you just felt like oh this is what I'm here for? Yeah, I think there's always moments like that. I think that's the thing when you watch a game is you know we're super organised and I I know exactly what we should be doing to every batsman and when you when you put down a plan and you the bowlers go and execute it and it comes off and you get a player out how you think you were going to get them out, that's hugely exciting. Of course. Um, and I think that's what builds the trust between you and the player um, is because, you know, it's, it's, it's not easy for a player to walk in with someone, particularly if you're a new player to a franchise, and just trust them on, this is, this is what I think you should be doing. It's right. easy for them to go, no, well, I've always done this. The thing is, you have to be accountable for that. You know, you mm. play a team game, so... Even though you do your individual skill, I always talk about cricket's a team game and you have to fit into a team plan. And if we work together as well as we can as a team, then we'll get the result that we want. It's challenging when certain players are going rogue and doing their own thing and you know, right. because you want to, what you want to know from your players is you're getting, a, you're getting some consistency in their performance. So, yeah, and that takes time. So you get great players who you might offer them and some advice or thought and it can take a year, two, three years before they perhaps will change something or do something different outside of their comfort zone. Um, but when they do, or if they do and they have success, then that, that trust builds, okay, this person knows what they're talking about, I might be able to yeah. um, do something else. And, and to me, that's what my job is. You know, you have bowlers come in with a certain skill set, this is what they do, and my job is to make them better. That's the first job as a coach. And the only right. way I'm gonna do that is to ask them to offer them something, ask them to practice it, and then go out and have the confidence to go out and try it in a game. I mean, Akash Madhwal is obviously like the, the standout, uh, uh, like the person who I think none of us were, who were watching were expecting. Five for five, second uh, best best figures by a uh, Mumbai Indians uh, uh, bowler ever. I want to talk to you about him and I also want to talk to you about Piyush Chavla. Yeah. Because Piyush Chavla gets trolled a lot because like recently a lot of us discovered that Virat Kohli is younger, <laughs> is older than him. Yeah. And you're like, this guy's been around and he's been doing successfully well for quite some time. Um, so I would love to know, get some insights on, on those two particular players. 
Yeah, Akash was great. I mean, we had a couple of guys, this Akash and Kumar Kartike, who came yeah. out of the net bowlers. So, yeah. you know, when we, um, I think we went to the UAE, we had net bowlers because of the COVID stuff. We would have a band of net bowlers who would travel around uh, with us at the same time. Yeah. So they, they, were, they always felt like they were part of the team. They're really well looked after um, and got an opportunity through their performances in the nets that they were selected in the squad and then obviously going. Akash is a smart guy. Um, what I love about both those two players is just their attitude, their, their training attitude every day. Mm. And, you know, you talked about coming from a job. You know, Kumar came from, you know, left home at 16, I think, before he would, said he was going to come back when he made something of himself. Wow. So he was away from home for nine years. And, and Akash is an educated, smart guy who obviously right. understands, you know, what work is and how this is an opportunity for him. And, you know, he took those, both those guys have taken that opportunity, which shows a lot of mental strength to walk out in the IPL and have that success. And, I think that's the fun part, is working with some guys who have come from net bowlers, elevated to the squad, and yeah. then find themselves in the starting eleven and playing well. Um, you know, that's really cool. And, and it's, that's the beauty of a coach, right? You get to enjoy that success. You get to see, meet their parents, see the excitement of their parents, their family, themselves having that success, the team around them, because they know how the, what they've done to get there. Um, and yeah, those two guys really stand out. It was a cool story this year. I mean, the other, the other cool story talking about families, of course, Arjun Tendulkar. Uh, and again, the amount of pressure on that, on the, on that uh, guy has got to be immense. Um, and a lot of people are commenting about his unusual run-up because he has a slightly unusual thing. And I'm like, yeah, lots of cricketers, like some people hop, some people do different things. So I'm sure there's a lot of outside noise pointed towards his direction. So how do you, I mean, is, is that part of your job to tell somebody like him that, hey, listen, focus on what's at hand? Oh, you, you can't, you can tell someone, but ultimately it's, I'm not affected by the noise that's being put on Arjun. Like, right. um, and to his credit, it's sort of water off a duck's back to him. He, he seems to have an ability to park that to the side, which is pretty cool. He said it's never easy to be, you know, the son of one of the greatest players of all time. And, you know, and I notice it now at home with my son as he moves through the grades at cricket. People talk about, you know, he's my son and right. he's the same. He sort of just parks it to the side. It's sort of irrelevant to him. So. In the end, he's just got to stand on his own two feet and let his performance. And regards to run up and actions and all that, just everybody does it different. Everyone, okay. Everyone's got their own way. You've just got to find the most of what the tools and the way you move and do things. You've got to find the way to be um, absolutely as efficient and as best as you can with the tools you've got. And that's what you can do. I mean, also the the video that trended was Arjun Tendulkar eating his own. Oh, yeah, I'm not going to talk about that. <laughs> <laughs> he copped enough <laughs> stick about that from the team. Well, I mean, but, and then people pointed out that Virat Kohli did the same, oh. so he's in good company. It's, I think okay. it was. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> no comment. <laughs> okay, I got, I got to talk to you about this, uh, about something with that, that I'm very curious about. When, when you're coaching somebody and in the nets, is, are people constantly tracking the no balls? Because it seems like sometimes, uh, like, I mean, not in the IPL, but sometimes you'll see some young Indian bowler or whatever saying, oh, look at me bowling, and you're like, that's a clear no ball, you're like a foot above the thing. Yep, that's 100%. That's one of the things we talk about as a no-no. Yeah. I'm on the players all the time. We have umpires at place at training. It's just, it's, you know, we can't do that because okay. we saw this year it just has such a big impact on the game. And, uh, Akash was a guy who really improved that as the as the season went on. And that's what you say is you, it's, it's just a not negotiable. Right. So it's, it's fr it is hugely frustrating from a coaching point of view. And, and you just want those disciplines to be in place uh, so that you don't make those mistakes, because you try to control all the things that you can. Yeah, and that's one thing you can control. What is the most expensive no ball you've ever bowled? Like where you're like, oh my god, that cost a lot in your in your career. Do you remember anything? Oh, I remember nicking off Graham Smith in a World Cup, I think in in uh, the oh, Wanderers, yeah. um, and it, and, he, and it wasn't on too many, and he went and whacked 50, I think, and South Africa made 310, and we won that game. But every any time that you bowl, I think I bowled Sachin on a no ball. Might not have been a no ball because my <laughs> foot slid forward and he I went from 13 that. to 80 or something like that in a test match. So, yeah, it's, um, yeah, and you've seen that a lot recently in the Ashes yeah. series and other series where those moments, even in test cricket, have been yeah, yeah, yeah. you know, hor horrible. It's the worst feeling. Because <laughs> you celebrate in the moment, it's, oh. Yeah, and, and all you can do is blame yourself and everyone on your team gets annoyed at you. Yeah. So yeah, it's just one of those things you don't want to do. Okay, let's come to uh, the last couple of questions that I have for you. Is of course about the World Cup that's coming up, and I'd love to know from a bowling POV, uh, who do you think has the best stocked side from a bowling POV for this World Cup, and also what kind of aims do you think, like what kind of strategies do you think people are going to employ? Because again, uh, ODI is different from T20, etc. 
Yeah, it's a good question. Um, I think bowling-wise, it's pretty even right. across the board. Um, you would, I mean, you look at New Zealand and made two World Cup finals, and if they put out, you know, the Bolts, Henry, Southie, Ferguson, Santner combination, that's been successful for a yeah. while now. So. Um, New Zealand have lost Michael Bracewell to a knee injury, so right. I think when I look back and go, India played sort of four main bowlers and used Uvery, so the part-time spinners become important in India if the conditions you think play the way. I think I think the teams are really even. Hmm. I, I mean, injuries. New Zealand's been affected by injuries. We're going to have the same with other teams, but the you'd think that India would still be favourites in their own own conditions, but I, I couldn't put my um, finger on who I think is going to win the World Cup. I think it's that wide open. It's going to be bloody interesting. I think Pakistan generally yeah. have one of the strongest bowling attacks, and I still think they do. So if they can get enough runs, they'll be pretty tough to beat too. Shine Shah Freedy is one of those people who, when you see him bowling, you're like, oh man, I'm, I'm shedding my pants. Yeah, Just yeah I do love watching Shaheen yeah. bowl. I mean, I, I saw him bowl. I took a New Zealand A team to the UAE right. a few years ago, and he was, I think, 19 and came steaming in there. Oof. Nassim Shah's gun. Yeah, you yeah. know, they've just got these bowlers who bowl heat. So every time Pakistan come on, to bowl their bowlers come on, they just feel like something's going to happen. And obviously, you've still got Shut Up Gun and yeah. Mud Wilson. You've got these, they're a bloody good team. So uh, they're in a bowling attack I really enjoy watching bowl. So, in terms of out and out bowling attacks, they've probably got the strongest bowling attack. I That's think. probably true, yeah. Who, who are the, uh, this is the one additional question. Like, I mean, there's a lot of great pace bowlers going around. And I mean, of course, India, uh, we, we've got the young Umran Malik as well as Mohsin Khan, who everybody's looking at, at, at breaking pace barriers. And of course, Bumrah is back now. Who is the who are the two three way across the globe? You just see them running in, and you just get goosebumps with excitement or whatever. Uh, I think Mark Wood was obviously Oof. one, and the, yeah, the, the, yeah. the he's the standout for me. Like um, just because he's at top end, he's 33, so he's he's probably not going to get any quicker. Right. And, and then you know you, you you he'll probably dip down a little bit, but geez, at the moment he's he's proper gas. I think the thing like in, in the scene in the IPL is pace is one thing, but. To have success, you have to move the ball off the straight. I, I suppose for myself, when you look at those guys like Shoaib and, and Brett, we, we swung the ball. Mm. And, and when you bowl 150 plus and swing the ball, that's when you can be devastating. Um, so otherwise, the out and out paces almost can be your enemy. You know, right. and, and you can't maintain 155 plus for very long. You generally right. sort of slip back into the, to the 90 miles an hour barrier, which again, if it's straight up and down, is, you know, if you're not accurate, you can travel the distance. So. You know, Ferguson bowls fast, Wood bowls fast. Outside of that, there's not there's not many around who are bowling really quick. Right. Obviously, I've seen Umran Malik at the IPL, and he had he has had game-changing spells. He had one against us at Mumbai. Right. But he's got a lot of work to do in terms of his um, accuracy and his ability to move the ball and a good change of pace and stuff. But you know, there's certainly some raw talent there. Absolutely. Uh, Shane, you've been part of, part of my childhood. I always used to love watching you bowl, so thank you so much for your time. Really pleasure. appreciate it. Thanks a lot. No worries, mate. Uh, really appreciate my it. Pleasure. And best of luck for GT20 as well. Uh, and uh, Yeah, finals time. Hopefully yeah, finals. we can... Good uh, weekend. Yeah, it's going to happen. Eh? Exciting times uh, for, for the final. I mean, obviously, expectations to win. Uh, how are you going about it? Yeah, we, we I mean, the wicket's been challenging. We've, right. got a good, we've got a good team. There's some good teams here. I think we're all excited about the opportunity for cricket in Canada. I mean, yeah. I've always wanted to come here. Yeah. It's been awesome. We've done some cool Niagara Falls, baseball, it's beautiful. Um, and, you know, I've seen, watched like, um, you know, we've got a few Dutch Kiwis here. And they've just qualified <laughs> for the World Cup. Yeah, yeah. So to see some of these countries now, and I think the, the T20 World Cup's having even more teams than 20 teams. So yeah. to see some of these, they're called associate countries now, but they're now better than that, I think, the Namibia the Netherlands. Um, you know, you, you, there's some real talent here in Canada, so you, you're hoping we can sort of play a part in in um, nourishing that talent. I played Canada at a couple of World Cups yeah. and hoping that they'll come through and, you know, and who knows, in 10 years' time be like the Netherlands are now, you know, really pushing some of those top teams. Oh, yeah, Netherlands is, I mean, it's one of the teams I'm looking forward to in the World Cup as well. Mate, there's I a few Dutch story. Kiwis in there and, and <laughs> I mean, that's a credit to themselves. They're beating and playing consistent cricket all the time and, and we played them at the T20 World Cup and warm-up games and they, they're, a, they're a competent side and a good side. and. Um, and that's the exciting things when you're getting these associate associate players come and play in these tournaments now yeah. around the world, the ILT20 here. They're getting better and better being around the players all the time. And I think that's great that the game's growing. And that's why T20 is so good, because in this format, it just expands the base of cricket. And that's what you want. Absolutely. I like how you uh, you, you reminded me that we have to talk about the GT20. I completely forgot. <laughs> <laughs> I'm like, should I be so, where are yeah. we? We completely forgot. We got it in the end. Yeah, we got that yeah. in the end. Uh, okay, for anybody tuning in, uh, uh, do give some love to Shane. Uh, uh, by the way, I heard that you're on social media just to uh, See what the kids are doing. 
That's I, I am, mate. Yeah, yeah, like um, I just have to monitor what my teenage daughters are up to, and they're not getting into too much trouble. I had a few years of them getting into trouble, so yeah, it's starting to chill out a bit now, so I can yeah. sort of lay off. And yeah. yeah, there's a, a, a true parents talking. Like, yeah, what yeah, you yeah. yeah. That? I'm a proper dad. Yeah. yeah. Uh, so give some love to Shane across the board if you enjoyed the conversation. Again, GT20, a lot of highlights from previous matches. There's been so many legendary uh, uh, games uh, this year, uh, and uh, again, hopefully you guys win the final as well. And uh, thanks for watching. Lots more interviews coming up here, and lots of for non-cricket related stuff as well so keep watching thanks a lot uh, for watching uh, uh, love you all marry me goodbye that's the goodbye thank you shane thank you really appreciate it once thanks, more mate. No thanks worries. a lot thanks mate that was fun enjoy it yeah. so easy yeah. <laughs> easy that breezy. was funny the gta t20 just <laughs> yeah i genuinely forgot what we were supposed to do um, he was he was rapid he's quick but my favorite or brett lee's favorite was shane bond no, oh, yeah. He was the most complete fast bowler. Um, I would say Muhammad Asif was one of the complete, complete packages that could ever ask for is uh, Asif. But you know, unfortunately, this guy was ruined his career.